Hello and welcome to the readings for the third Sunday in Advent. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The reading comes from the beginning of John's Gospel. A man came, sent by God. His name was John. He came as a witness, as a witness to speak for the light so that everyone might believe through him. He was not the light, only a witness to speak for the light. And this is how John appeared as a witness when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He not only declared, but he declared quite openly, I am not the Christ. Well then they said, Are you Elijah? I'm not, he said. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We must take back an answer to those who sent us. What have you got to say about yourself? So John said, I am, as Isaiah prophesied, a voice that cries in the wilderness, make a straight way for the Lord. Now these men had been sent by the Pharisees and they put this further question to him. Why are you baptizing if you're not the Christ, not Elijah, and not the prophet? And John replied, I baptize with water, but there stands among you one unknown to you, the one who is coming after me and I'm not fit to undo his sandal strap. This happened at Bethany on the far side of Jordan where John was baptizing. I do like it when, if you're presented with the wrong question, the thing to do is not to answer the wrong question. So here is John asked, why are you baptizing? And instead of talking about himself and the process of baptism, he immediately draws people's attention to Jesus. and talks about the Lamb of God who is going to be so much greater than he is. As we come to Advent, it's the season for repentance, for spring cleaning, for renewal, for trying to get rid from our hearts and our lives of everything that crams God out. And the need for that is really quite obvious. We live enormously busy lives, lives that are often so full <clears throat> uh, that it's hard to pray it's hard to worship. There are so many demands upon us. But of course, that's partly because we live lives not in the spirit. It's wonderful the way in which John says, I'm baptizing with water, but he's going to baptize with spirit. And that ought to be a reminder to us that our lives are essentially meant to be lives that are drawn more and more deeply into the world of the spirit. Of course, part of the problem comes that people mean different things by spirit. But here, in, in the New Testament, we have a, a very different understanding of spirit to the way in which secular society has used it. Um, in the last 150 years, the idea of spirit as, as geist, uh, a, a driving force underlying the movement in, in culture, um, is very often the way it's understood. But we understand spirit as the, the Holy Spirit, the spirit who will transform us, who will change us, who will unpeel us so that our mind and our body don't get in the way of our souls and that perhaps is one of the things that we ought to concentrate on at Advent more than anything else this struggle in our tripartite selves between the mind and the body and the spirit it's interesting the way in which John as a prophet tamed his body so we hear he lived on locusts and wild honey some of the books I've read suggest that we've mistranslated locusts um, but in, actual, in fact, the locust, the real, the Aramaic word, was a plant of some kind, which strikes me as being more likely than, than, than eating of locusts, but it's not terribly important. What John was doing was not living a normal life of normal indulgence and normal needs. He was stripping himself right down to the very bare essentials so that his word could be heard more clearly. And to some extent, we're asked to follow the same principles in Advent, to try and strip our lives down to the bare essentials. But of course, the great call in Advent is for the whole church to repent and for us ourselves personally to repent. We might ask society to repent if we had the confidence. I think one of the things I'm saddest about is the way in which Christians of my generation have, have lost so much confidence in God always on the defensive, always frightened of being found out as a believer. And yet, if we 
asked questions of the society we live in. To what extent have you realized your aims? Some of the, the, the more far out attempts to regularize society and make it equal um, have, have failed very badly. With such a, a misgrasp of sex and gender, our society has been trying, for example, for equal pay and keeps on saying through the media there is no equal pay. There's still this terrible pay gap between men and women. But of course, it's been illegal for 30 or 40 years to pay women differently. Um, that's not talked about. It's, there's the assumption that there is a, a calculation over, over lifetime earnings. That's where the pay gap comes in. Uh, entirely disregarding the fact that women have a primary biological function for looking after children and are always in that sense where children are going to be conceived and brought up to be in a different category from men. But this is part of the, the disreputable, the intellectually dishonest way in which society deals with its own values. If we say, to what extent have you managed to bring about your own values of equality. Society says, well, we haven't. Um, and, and indeed, we know as Christians that it can't be done because we know that the real problem lies not in the bluntness of legislation or the, the difficulty of pushing through social policy. We know the problem with equality lies in the way the human heart is made. The human heart is flawed. We live with disordered appetites, of pride and, and anger and greed and desires that uh, displace our neighbours' interests in favour of our own. And all the attempts to make an equal and fair and just society by passing laws are doomed. Christians are so quiet about this. We should look and say, look, look at the opportunities you've had to pass laws. You've lived in a benign, intellectually progressive society now since the Second World War. Why do you find it so difficult? Do you really think it's because you haven't passed the right laws? No, it's about the human heart. We should call upon society to repent and say, look, your understanding of human nature is flawed. You've got it wrong. We have a different analysis. It's an analysis born of, of 3,000 years of reflection and spiritual inspiration, starting with the book of Genesis, which tells a story about how we have gone wrong, how always humankind has mismanaged the equation about between what we can do and what we can live with. Just because you can do something, can you live with the consequences of your choice, asks the book of Genesis. Yes, if you want to learn to live in a world fully apprehensive of good and evil, can you be sure you'll make the right choices? Adam and Eve are faced with that and they discover they can't. And this is the great flaw in human nature. We should be saying to society, can you always tell the difference between good and evil? And society, if it was honest, would stop and say, no, we're not very good at it. And we would say, but that we as Christians have given ourselves to exactly that task. We can help you. You're very welcome to see if we're wrong. Let's, let's look at the outcome of the choices or of our moral values. But we're so frightened of the world and of secularism and of its aggression that we don't ask that we don't pose the right questions for the society around us and say look consider changing your mind consider a metanoia a repentance a change of direction but we ourselves are called to repentance this metanoia this change of mind and i think one of the things we have to do as we try and do it is to be clear about how we are made up and how we work if we go back to the, the sense that we're body, mind and spirit again, the great difficulty we have with our bodies in our present society is that, is that our media, our, our environment, is fixated on the body and on sexuality to an extraordinary degree. Most of us know there's a terrible gap between our sexual desires and the way in which we can live with our sexuality. Um, the very fact that pornography is as... Uh, is as powerful and as wealthy and, and as uh, wide-ranging as it is, ought to give us some kind of indication that we've got sex wrong, the appetite ran out of control. The idea that we even are giving in to a, to a social culture where we define ourselves by our sexual appetite. Are we gay or bi or straight or... and then the alphabet soup that follows. 
How do we allow sexual appetite to become so powerful that it becomes almost the first thing that you display in terms of your labelling? It's incredible. Again, we ought to say to society, are you handling this well? And society comes back not believing that humanity is flawed and says, well, we could do better. If we had more education, we could. And because we know perfectly well that's not true. The problem is not with education, it's with temptation. The problem is that we face a spiritual perverting evil that constantly wants to exacerbate our appetites, to make us addicts to things that, if we don't control, will take us over. Once again, we ought to be able to say to the world, look, we're not very good at this ourselves. We're involved in a life or death struggle. We know what the struggle's about. And we survive by the skin of our teeth with the help of God once we learn to repent. But you, you've made the most dreadful mess of it. And at one of the same time, the world insists on labelling people by their sexual appetite and then complains desperately about the level of sexual abuse and sexualization that our society is overwhelmed by sex sells so it's inevitably caught up horribly with the economy and all the time we find things sexualized that have nothing to do with sexual appetite because we've become addicted as a society and sometimes as people it's a very good thing that that uh, pornography is being flagged up as something to which too many men have given themselves and need help from to escape the gravitational power of but of course it's not just sex our body represents a whole range of, of appetites it's astonishing that we live in a society when there's so much food where one of the greatest problems is, is eating disorders again that ought to flag up the society is asking the wrong questions once again the equilibrium the inner equilibrium of human beings has somehow been very badly distorted terrible the way in which our own self image is conditioned by what other people think of us because of this this tsunami of social media that we found ourselves surrounded by in the last 20 years the, the, the world of likes and dislikes the world of how many followers do you have uh, and the way in which a, a technological community uh, has replaced what used to be a network of friends and families which we have so much less time for now, partly because uh, on our online life is so much more accessible. But we've got it wrong again. And once again, we need to be able to say to ourselves and to the world, our appetites and our analysis are mistaken. And we're recalled to engage on a metanoia, a taking of stock again. Body, mind and spirit. If there's so much about the way in which we manage our appetites and define our bodies, what about our minds? I'm very struck by Douglas Murray's title of his book. I like the book itself. The contents are wonderful. The Madness of Crowds. But I'm struck by the title in particular because of the way in which Douglas Murray recognises as a secular atheist that the world has gone mad. There is a kind of madness, a collective madness that's carrying us along terribly and distorting the way we think. There's a very interesting passage in 2 Thessalonians 2, which I came across the other day as I was reading. Let me pull it up. So St. Paul is talking about, about the, uh, the oncomingness of evil. And he says, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and all false signs and wonders. So here we're going to be faced with a culture of deception. And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love truth and be saved. One of the things we're supposed to do as Christians is tell the truth, the truth about human nature and the truth about God who made us. And above all about our moral accountability to him. Again, one of the things we don't do is say to the society around us, look, you're very aware of the need for morals and ethics. You're constantly preaching to everybody, including Christians, about what is good and what is bad. Where do you get your morals from? How do you construct your own ethical hierarchy of values? Where, where is it from? And the answer is most people haven't thought about it at all. They're swept along by the crowd, of which is imposed a degree of deceptive moral relativism upon us all. And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love truth and to be saved. Therefore, 
God sends them a strong delusion so they may believe what is false in order to be condemned. But all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Well, that's the danger of the appetites, the pleasure. And it seems to me that 2 Thessalonians 2 is very similar to Romans 1 where the Lord looks again at us and says, if you insist on worshipping idols, refusing the truth that I'm offering you, then I'll give you over to a whole series of disordered appetites and you will suddenly find that the categories of order that I have placed you in for your safety and your well-flourishing are dissolved and disordered. Well, of course, that's exactly what's happened. We should never, of course, blame people with different orientations from ourselves. That's It's not for us to blame. Sorry about the clocks going on. What we ought to do, I think, is look at what lies behind what St Paul says, which is it's the repudiation of the truth about who we are and who God is that leads to the disorder. It's because people take pleasure in unrighteousness and refuse the truth. To some extent, this allows Christians to be forgiven. We must and should and can tell people about the truth and try and engage in a conversation. But we know that for many people, they do actually love unrighteousness. They, they love a disordered life. There's something, this is, a, this is a spiritual reaction against the living God. It's very interesting to see the way in which progressive culture takes aim against the Judeo-Christian categories of morality and takes some kind of delight in bringing them down. Even all the very the, the, the attractive language of progressive culture, inclusion, tolerance and equality are, are the very opposite of what we find we're taught in scripture. So as for tolerance, well, we're not told to tolerate those things that are untrue. If a different picture of God comes along, provided by a different religion, different prophets, different values that tell a different story, produce a different character, and Allah is a very different God from Yahweh, then we ought to be able to say we can't tolerate this because the truth really matters. It matters enormously. It's a bit, it's a bit like the way in which our scientists have been searching for a vaccine. They, the truth absolutely matters. They've got to match the vaccine with the virus. The facts and the truth and the reality are critical in making this thing work. How is it that in science people recognise the need for truth is completely and utterly overwhelming, but in culture it doesn't matter in the slightest? As if there were two completely different worlds, one of fact and one of value. Well, that must be nonsense. Truth matters wherever you go. There are lots of things we can't tolerate. We can't tolerate disorderedness. We can't tolerate an analysis of human nature that isn't true. It isn't true to say you can educate people to be better. If you do that, you waste resources and you end up making things worse than you ever were because you haven't got the prescription right or the diagnosis. So we can't tolerate things that aren't true and we shouldn't. And the notion of inclusion is, is, is dreadful as if, as if we're not able to make any distinction between people who, who belong in and those who belong out. We make a distinction in terms of exclusion every time we send people to jail. If we said, as some people do, that you should abolish all the jails and the whole penal system in order that everyone should be included, rapists, paedophiles, burglars, anarchists, uh, murderers, should they all be included in society? No, we exclude some people for the safety of the vulnerable because the safety of the vulnerable is more important than the notion of inclusion. But inclusion too is not a concept that we find in the scriptures either. God is going to exclude those who rebel against him. Why? Because he values and respects the priority of their own choices. God has given us freedom of choice. God puts freedom of choice beyond forcible inclusion. Who would disagree with that? Who would want to be turned into a robot in order to be included? Well, if we refuse the robotic because we insist on having the integrity of our own lives of choice, you can't have inclusion because counting ourselves out was, is going to be part of exercising our self-will. What does C.S. Lewis say so clearly? He says in the end, it all comes down to thy will be done as we speak to God or my will be done. If it's thy will be done, then we are included. If it's my will be done, then I'm excluded from God because I've chosen the self 
rather than God who made me. And it's a stupid thing to do because I'm totally contingent and dependent upon God. Why cut my umbilical cord? Why, why cut the lifeline by which I hang, I am connected to God as I hang over the abyss of, of, of disorder, destruction and desolation? Why cut that? Why not say thy will be done and be saved? Because pride gets in the way. So in the world of the mind, we too need to ask ourselves, we need to repent of the way in which we've lazily or sloppily been tempted to give way to progressive values which are incoherent and self-contradictory and so often aimed against God. The third one, of course, is equality. There is no equality. There is instead responsibility, though God makes that very clear. Jesus, right through the Gospels, talks about those to whom much is given and those to whom less is given. And the difference is that of whom those from those to whom much is given, much will be required. We know that. That's one of the most... I remember when I was 16, finding that in the Gospel somewhere and writing it out in a calligraphic script and putting it on a bookcase. I felt I'd been given much and I knew perfectly well that much was going to be required of me. And so uh, as we look at the way society works uh, and, um, and the Pareto curve, the fact that in any society there will be a wholly uneven distribution of wealth and poverty, an uneven distribution of gifts and competence and incompetence. We can't pretend we live in a flat society where people are as intelligent, as dutiful, as diligent, as moral, as honest as each other they aren't but and we know this particularly because we live in a world divided by the whole struggle between good and evil and the real division is between those who say yes to good and no to evil and those who say yes to evil and no to good and there's a vast middle ground where most of us are where the way in which to get closer to good is to repent advent is the time to look and to ask god for help to repent Much of the problem, the way the church works at the moment, is because we don't understand the world of the spirit and the world of the soul. We have ditched the supernatural for the rational and for the empirical. It was when I became clearer about the Eucharistic miracles and I looked at my own experience and my need for the Eucharist, meeting Jesus in the sacrament. I would say meeting Jesus in the word too, because again a miracle takes place then when we listen to the word and the Holy Spirit causes some kind of electricity between our heart and the word or our hearts leap for joy something smites us between the eyes some miracle takes place of spiritual connection revelation inspiration but also in the sacraments so importantly but the church today has given up on the supernatural it's given up on the salvation of souls it stopped it appears to have lost the confidence of belief in that souls need saving the soul is a very distinct part in my experience and the experience of the saints and of the church of the human body. A number of things happen to the mind and the body which don't touch the soul. You can't nourish the soul through correct thinking and correct eating. The soul has to be nourished by Jesus. One of the ways in which we can deepen our repentance during Lent is perhaps to use ways of praying that are good for the soul, less good for the mind and the body. They bypass them. The Jesus prayer is a very profound way of pursuing repentance. It's a very simple prayer. It's part of the hesychastic prayer tradition. That means a repetitive prayer. And it goes, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. There's a, a mistaken Protestant uh, response to this, which says, didn't Jesus condemn vain repetition? And yes, he did. He condemned vain, vain repetition, but not useful repetition, not spiritually potent repetition, not the kind of repetition that rubs away at the soul in order to clear away the muck, because a certain rubbing and constant repetitive cleansing is required. There's nothing wrong with repetition. It's the vanity, the uselessness that, that Jesus is talking about. And so the early church fathers particularly is in their flight into the desert to pursue lives of prayer in order to diminish the power of evil in culture and in the cities. They came upon this tradition of praying constantly, praying in the spirit, praying repetitively. 
And the idea was that the, the, the demons don't like it when you say Jesus with love. Of course, they love it when you say Jesus as a blasphemy. Have you noticed how many people who don't believe, have no concern at all, use the word Jesus as a blasphemy, as an expletive, as a swear word? The devils love that. It is demonic, in fact, it's demonically inspired. It's one of those marionette strings that the demonic forces attach to us, to twitch us, to, to make us resonate with what matters to evil. Well, they dislike it enormously when we use the word Jesus in love and in prayer. So the first part of the prayer goes, Lord Jesus Christ, for as soon as a human being proclaims Jesus is Lord, the world is nearer to being put right. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, the kind of attitude you need is the same as this one. And then he told the story about the publican and the sinner. I'm sure you remember it well. And the publican, the, sorry, the, the, the publican and the Pharisee. <laughs> the Pharisee says, thank you, Lord, for this, that and the other. And the, and the publican gets on his knees and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, that's right. That's the attitude. And as we pray this prayer repetitively, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Linking with our breathing, with our breathing, the mind gets fed up. There's no entertainment for the mind in this prayer. But it sinks down into, into us somewhere and the heart and the soul begin to chime with it. And for those who use this prayer, you find, you find a, an, inner, an inner prayer life, a, a stretching of the soul. It's kind of aerobics for the soul whilst the mind is bypassed. We need to pray more during Advent as part of our own penitence. And as we practice penitence we try and clear away the clutter the stuff that's in the way the mental clutter the physical clutter and the and the way in which we've deprived our souls of of the sacraments and of prayer so we get ourselves ready for jesus coming in the dead of night in the dead of winter at the dead end of the year because jesus is going to come at the time when it's blackest and darkest and coldest and he's going to reverse the whole process and it doesn't matter how dark, how black, cold or dark the world is, Jesus heals and saves it if the world says yes. It doesn't matter how dark, black or cold we are, if we say yes to him, we too get saved. And this is, this is the wonderful miracle. Not everyone will believe. So many people are under the delusion, have entered into the madness of crowds. But what we have to do is to love them and to be willing to talk about it. But most of all, to practice it. Because as we practice Christianity, we sound, we feel different. We give off a different, a different signal. One of the things that most attracted me in the beginning were authentic Christians. I have to say inauthentic Christians repulsed me. <laughs> but there's no doubt at all that authentic Christians most powerfully attracted me. Holiness is deeply attractive because it, it raises a scent, a sound, a magnetic attraction to show how things can be put right. So as we continue with Advent and we allow our Lord to take us deeper into the darkness, let us hold on to him, let us repudiate that rejection of the truth, repudiate the delusion, continue to worship, to adore, to love, to pray, to hope and to get on our knees and repent. To God alone be the glory in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.